Hi, how are you guys tonight? Everybody good? Yeah. Good. But I know this is serious because this is not just a class, it's a master <laughs> class. It kind of reminds me when I went to Amherst College, the debate team at UMass, we used to call them UMass debate. But anyway. <laughs> So I have to be actually somewhat serious here. I'm supposed to actually give you folks information, which isn't good. I'm, I'm, I'm a writer. I'm not a teacher. And there's a, a, a huge difference between them. So what I thought I would do is similar to what uh, I know Elmore Leonard always does, is I kind of just jotted down the little rules of writing that I've come up with. And I'm trying at the time just to stimulate your brain on it and make you think about it a little bit. And some of them may be against what you've heard from other teachers. So if I say something and another teacher gives you the opposite advice, Listen to me, because really, <laughs> whoever else was, doesn't know what they're talking about, I'm right, they're wrong. Okay, um, let's, get, let's start with the basics, getting down to the nitty gritty. And that is, you know, the most common question a writer is asked is, where do you get your ideas? Like there's a boutique in the village that sells them. <laughs> and the truth is, anything can stimulate an idea. The tabloid headline, Boy 16, you know, grandmother marries it, Asner. You know I mean, like anything. <laughs> Can simulate an idea. And you have to kind of let all these in weird information into your head and don't dismiss ideas right away and just kind of play around with them a little bit. I'm going to, uh, which I always try to do, is to explain exactly how I came up or some of the nuggets that kind of became books. Um, this is not a pretty process and this is one of the important things to remember about writing. I always say that a novel is a little bit like a sausage. You might like the final taste, you probably don't want to know how it was made. It's an ugly, <laughs> sort of an ugly thing. Um, but I'm going to try to explain to you how I came up with a, with, a, with a few different book ideas. Oftentimes a very small thing. Most of the time um, it's something in, in my regular life. Um, I'm looking over there at those books. Man, I didn't apply. Well, The Woods, I, I, I got into a, um, oh, the innocent. I got into a fight um, when I was in college. I actually wasn't in a fight. One of my friends was. And it was that, you know, each school that you had that tough guy, his name was like Biff or something like that, <laughs> who could kick everybody's ass. I remember every other school had a Biff too. And when the two Biffs meet up, it's not pretty. And in college, and the two Biffs met up, and my Biff was getting his ass kicked pretty good. And so a bunch of us were, tr were trying to step in, and there was too many to hold back. And it's always that what if when I grabbed that guy? What if when I grabbed him, I twisted hard, and he fell, and he died? And I got blamed for it. That was the first sort of what if that started. What if I started the book with that? I started the book with a fight like this, where my hero does that. The second thing that was going on at that time, so I think I wrote this book in around 2004, is these things were somewhat new, a little newer. And I remember a friend of mine saying, aren't these unbelievable having this little like, thing I could take a picture of? So now if I'm at work, I can get pictures of my kid playing baseball or all those things I would normally miss out on. And I thought, what if? What if he got a picture of his wife in a hotel room with another man? That would be a bad thing. <laughs> That's sort of the what if that started that book going. And every book kind of has that what if moment. Um, the better example, probably so, uh, Promise Me, is another, uh, the, the Promise Me was, when I, was my, my return to a character I've written for a long time named Myron Bolton. And the idea for Promise Me, again, came from real life. I overheard a couple teenagers who I adored, listening, okay, so take yeah. attention here. Um, oh, I, overheard, I overheard them talking about drinking and driving. You know, they were going out with friends, and friends had a little too much to drink and all of that. And I, being very mature, I came down and I said, promise me, title the book, you won't do that. Here's my card, I don't care what time it is, I don't care if it's three in the morning, I don't care if you're in New York, I don't care what you're on. Promise me you'll call me, I promise I'll come and pick you up and not ask any questions. Maybe some of you have made similar kind of things. Now, in real life, nothing else happened, that was the end. But what if? What if a, you know, a, a high school senior girl called me, and my hero, and he goes into New York City, and he picks her up, and he drops her off at what he thinks is a friend's house, and the next day she's gone. No one in the house even knows who she is. Yeah, that would be a bad day too. You know? What if? <laughs> Trying to always start with the what if. No second chance, start with a sentence. The sentence, and I don't know how it came to me, but the sentence was, when the first bullet hit my chest, I thought of my daughter. I really, to this day, don't know where that sentence came from. But I said, wouldn't it be cool to start a book with that sentence? Would, you know, asking all those questions, well, who shot him? What happened? Why is he thinking of his daughter? What's going on with her? Where is the daughter right now? And that, I built an entire book around that. The best example I, I always like to give is Tell No One, the one that's now a movie. By the way, if you have a, if you have Netflix Instant, uh, Tell No One is on. It's in French, it's with English subtitles. 
please, they, you can't watch it dubbed. Do not watch it dubbed. Watch it with subtitles. You'll get used to reading it very quickly. The dubbed is like I kept waiting for Raymond Burr and Godzilla. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's one of those kind of things. Many of you, it was nominated for nine Cesar Awards, which is their version of the Oscar. It won four of them. I'm in the movie, I should point out. I, I kind of steal it. Um, I'm in it for about eight seconds. I'm following Kristen Scott Thomas and Francois Cluzet at the train station. I'm in the background. I follow them for eight seconds. I don't speak, but I was brilliant, really. <laughs> it was a shame. Was, I think it was anti-Semitism. <laughs> Get the nod for that movie. Um, but anyway, tell no one is a better example of, of how you come up with an idea, because the ones I've just kind of given you sound sort of neat and clean, and you're kind of thinking like, oh, that and you know it's not. Like everything else in this process, when we say something, the writer in the back of his head is going, yeah, it's not really how we do it. This is more, because it's more like, have you ever had one of those nights you can't fall asleep until you remember the name of the dog in Petticoat Junction? <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, dog, it was a Sammy Jones. <laughs> and then you start wondering, how do I start thinking of something so moronic? And you try to trace your thoughts back, and they're bouncing all over the place. And you actually started with, how come you know, Burger King doesn't serve Mountain Dew? You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> nothing to do. That's more, I think, better description of how the artistic process sort of works. Just letting your mind kind of go. So tell no one, the idea came to me from two different directions. One, this is what I mean by anything can stimulate an idea. I was watching a really crummy romance movie on TV. I won't mention the name of the movie, Mr. the Bottle. And um, <laughs> Nicholas Parks, good friend of mine, loved the guy, loved his book through that movie. <laughs> anyway, what struck me about the movie was it was that story that we've seen a lot. And this is also one of the great things to do is try to stay in the shades on his head. But we've seen a story a lot where the man loses his wife, and you know, the man's wife dies, and he can't go on. And then a hot babe walks by, and he's fine. Have you noticed this lady <laughs> in this movie? It's Angelina Jolie, or in that case, Robin Wright, or many drivers. Someone walks by, all of a sudden, this guy's turkey again. And I ask myself in those moments I get serious, what about the man who can't go on? What about the man who has truly lost his soulmate? Is there a way? I can find redemption for him. So this part of the idea, and it's over here. The second part of the idea, again, to get somewhat serious on, is I lost my parents at a fairly young age. For those of you who read my Myron Bolotar books, I overwrite the scenes between Myron and his parents. That's my therapy, tough. I imagine that's what would be if my parents were alive. Just skip it, Dylan. <laughs> so I was thinking, I'm on the computer one day, and I'm thinking the way we all do, wouldn't it be great if they were still alive? Wouldn't it be great if they had a moment to at least meet the grandchildren or whatever else? And I'm looking at a street camp. And I think to myself, what would I do if I saw my parents on the street camp? And I took these two ideas and I put them together. I said, okay, man and a woman happily married. The wife is murdered. Eight years pass. He still can't get over her death. He gets an email, he clicks a hyperlink, he sees a webcam, and his dead wife walks by. And the little Homer Simpson part of my brain goes, woo-hoo, yeah, that moment. <laughs> As a writer, if you're trying to write, you will know it happens. There's a moment. Now the problem with this is all these ideas, time that took about 20 minutes of work. Right? Oh, I'll just take it, Doug. This is three months of work, ladies and gentlemen. This is three months of sitting in the couch going, no, honey, I can't fill out the garbage. <laughs> I'm working. Can't you see I'm working? The hardest part of my job is convincing my wife I am. <laughs> okay, so we have our idea. This is sort of the, getting the idea, okay? The next part I always love to hear from people who are, okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna call you out if you, if you say this, and one of the writers up here says this, they're a liar, okay? I love to write. <laughs> I write only for myself. I don't care if anybody else reads it. That's like saying, I talk only to myself. <laughs> writing is about communication. Writing is not fun a lot of times. One of my favorite quotes on writing comes from either Hemingway, Dorothy Parker, or my favorite, Oscar Madison, who said, I don't like writing, I like having written. It's okay not to like writing. Does anybody in this room paint, by any chance? I, I always look, my friends who are painters are always telling me, it's so relaxing, it's so soothing. At the end of the day, if that canvas was still blank, wasn't it a good time? So when you sit back after you paint it all day, there's nothing there to show for it. Do you think it's a good time? No. It's not about the actual work. It's about having something that you create, the pride you take in creating something. And that's okay. If you're thinking, looking at that person there, wow, they're having such a great time writing. They're lost in their own little world. And God's coming down from them. Their fingers are, that's bullshit, okay? <laughs> Don't worry about it. Just write. Writing is hard work. It's okay. There's days that I write when I feel, or not often, the muse is sitting on my shoulder and it's an angelic voice whispering in my ear. And I'm like, wow, this is pretty good. This is pretty easy. 
And there are days, most of them, when every word is a struggle. It's like a case of mental constipation. You kill a horse. None of it is coming out. And you know what? When I look at those books, I can't tell you what days I wrote on the good days and what I wrote on the bad days. When you rewrite it, you can't tell the difference either. I can't tell you what days I wrote when I was wide awake, what days I was so tired I couldn't move, because it's all the same in the end. Especially since you're going to rewrite. We'll get to that in a little while. Because we're but my point is, you can always write. You can always push yourself through. It doesn't have to be a joyous experience. The joy is in the product. I'm skipping ahead. One of the things that I have on this list is, this is probably not going to work for this class. I hope you don't get mad at me, Jonathan. I'm not but <laughs> I'm not a big fan of talking about what you're writing about. Like, I never, you know, you're at a cocktail party and you meet that guy who wants to write a book. And you're like, okay, here's what my book's about. And they start telling you. And I can almost see the balloon going, I never talk about what I'm writing. Why? Not because I'm afraid you're going to steal, but I'm dying to tell you what the book is about. And the only way I'm going to get that satisfaction is to write the book. Telling you about it is a form of satisfaction. Giving somebody a few pages is a form. Don't allow yourself any satisfaction until you finish the whole book. I'm dying to tell you what my next book is going to be about. Ah, the only way I get to have that is to actually write it. Well, that was Steve. Give me a moment. I don't know where I am. <laughs> okay. You heard the other day some of you were here for Elmore Leonard. I always quote Elmore Leonard, one of his rules, because it's my first rule. It's the greatest quote ever in the history of writing. And if you learn nothing else tonight, I feel like you're learning something. Remember this quote from Elmore Leonard, which, uh, which I'm paraphrasing is, I try to cut out all the parts you'd normally skip. Isn't that genius? And I write like that no matter what I'm writing. I also write for Bloomberg View, I write for Parade Magazine, I write for the New York Times op-ed page. Every word, every paragraph, every sentence, every word you have to ask, is this compelling? Is this gripping? Is this moving the story forward? And if it's not, you've got to get rid of it. Doesn't mean you can't have large themes and change the world and all that, but every single thing, every description, every piece of setting has to be compelling. You know, like for when you were in college, you read that essay and you stick in that one paragraph, and no one's really going to notice that one. Kind of you can't have one of those in a 500 page novel. Every one of them has to count or get rid of it. I have a computer, my computer, I write, uh, I write by longhand and by on my laptop. And if people want to ask about that later, I'll be happy to talk more about that. But I have a file on my computer, most of you have something similar called Spare. I call mine Spare. And when I'm not sure if I should keep something in, I cut it out and I put it in Spare. So on a four to five, six hundred page manuscript, spare has been as short as 50 pages, maybe as long as 150 pages. I've written, and I just finished 23rd novel, which will be out in March. To date, I have never once put anything back. Not once. There's some lesson in that. I'm not sure what it is, but go with me on that. Not once. You can always cut. You can always make it better. Anybody ever watch like the deleted scenes when they buy the DVD of a movie? <laughs> have you ever seen one that mattered? Because have you ever seen one that would have made the movie better? No. And you know they were so painstaking to get rid of it. it can, you can always cut. And that's really the key a lot of times to write. Um, let's talk about research for a second because a lot of times I'm asked about research. Here's where I give one of those answers that's also slightly different than the writers. Um, I'm not a fan of research. I'm from the hum of few bars in the Bacon School of Research. We're all not trying to do this. I don't believe, if you're trying to write fiction, do not do any research. No. Okay, that sounds weird. I'm going to, I'm going to explain to you why. One, research is often an excuse we use not to write. <laughs> Gee, I'm going to write that scene in Park Avenue. But man, i got to go and smell the hot dog stands and watch the girls walk by. No, 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 no. You've been to Park Avenue. You have an imagination. Screw it, you have Google Earth. <laughs> Write the scene now. Go back later and worry about the research. Don't use research as an excuse not to write. Reason two. Have you ever read that cute book where the guy you know did a lot of research, so he keeps slowing down the story by including factoids? Not a problem with my books, because I don't know anything. <laughs> Knowledge is a dangerous thing. Third, we were just talking about this downstairs. Research puts you on the greatest single enemy in the history of mankind to a writer, the internet. You, the internet will suck away all of your time looking up one cute little item that you didn't click that button and that button. Ooh, there's a new weight loss product out. Yeah, that button. Oh, it's a great YouTube video. I gotta watch a cat juggling for 14 and a half minutes. Yeah. Do not go on the internet if you can help it. Okay, the internet is a poison. Okay, social networks are a poison. Anything, the key here is anything that takes you away from writing, bad. Anything that makes you write, 
Good. Okay? Very good. Um, some of you may be discouraged by rejection. And I'm not talking about my high school dating years. That could be a long story. I always joke that um, most of the girls that I dated um, in college were, or in high school were bisexual. I mentioned sex, and say bye. But um, here's something to put on your, if you're having trouble with that, and you've been rejected a lot, and you don't want to write anymore because of it, one yes makes all those no's disappear. You're one yes away from making all those no's disappear. I don't know a writer who didn't go through a lot of rejection before they got published. I really don't. And even when you get published, it's a long climb. I usually do a routine where I bring out my old covers. Okay, sometimes I bring out my first two books, which I will tell you right now, I got $2,000 of these for. Then I started writing the Myron Bolotar series. They were uh, paperback originals. The first one, I got $5,000 for. But by the fourth one, I don't want to brag, by the fourth one, I was up to six thousand. <laughs> Overnight. <laughs> Just like that. So if you're in, if you're one of these authors, don't be I've written two books, that I don't have much sympathy for you. Okay? It's a long haul. That's okay. That's okay. And it's one of the beauties in my day was my day, like I'm hundred years old. But in my day, we didn't have the internet or Amazon or reviews. So I didn't know what a lowly piece of crap I was. <laughs> I'm like, I'm a Dell, a major house, I'm a paperback original author, okay, but I'm, I'm you know, I'm, I'm the cat's ass, I'm doing all right. I had no, if I knew the odds of making it to where I am now, I would have committed suicide. <laughs> so don't worry about that. Just put your head down and write. Don't worry so much about that kind of stuff. Um, don't seek to be publishable. I hear this all the time. They'll be like, I just read this really crappy book. My crappy book is as good as this one. Why aren't I published like this piece of crap book? That's really, don't seek to be publishable. My mother, the early brow burning feminist, Jordan Coven, used to have a bumper sticker in her car that read, women who seek to be equal to men lack ambition. <laughs> <laughs> Writers who seek to be publishable lack ambition. Write what's going to be the greatest book of all time. It's going to change the genre. If you're writing a traditional mystery, it's going to change everything we think about traditional mysteries. If you're writing suspense, it's going to glue you to the page. Have that attitude. Okay, that's the only sort of way. And the same thing, when we're looking at markets, never try to follow a trend of the market. It never, ever works. First of all, by the time you do that, if you write, let's say, medical thrillers are in, by the time you write a medical thriller in six months, nine months, a year, your publishers, two, the trend is over. Second of all, as Stephen King used to say, shit has its own integrity. <laughs> You cannot fake it. Don't write something because you think it's going to sell. I love every one of these books. Other people don't. That's okay. I love what I write. And I don't know any successful writer who doesn't. Not one. I don't know. I hear all the time, like, these brilliant sort of literary writers are going to write a mystery to make a lot of money. How come that never happens? <laughs> because they don't have it. They don't have the love for it. If you don't love what you're writing, don't write. If you're writing purely for money, trust me, it's not going to work. Not to say you shouldn't. Write to make money, or write for money in the sense like Charles Dickens wrote for money. Every great writer historically wrote for money. Despite all the things we hear today from literary rap writers who tell us, oh, it's not about making money, they can't, you can't name one writer who lived more than 100 years ago who did not write purely for money in the end of the day. Okay, so don't worry about that either. All right, what else we got here? Voltaire, a quote from Voltaire. Don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. And if you write, you know what I'm talking about. How often do you stop yourself because you don't think it's good enough? How often are you self-editing yourself while you write? I know I do. I have to turn off that self-editing. I got to write it. Um, Anne Lamott, which is, by the way, the greatest single book on writing, Anne Lamott wrote, Bird by Bird, if you haven't read it, do. She has a chapter called The Shitty First Draft. It's OK. Just write. Turn off that self-editor for a while, because you're going to go back and rewrite it. We all paralyze self. Self-hatred is part of writing. I hate myself all the time when I'm writing. Right? I mean, I, I, I know I hit you as a bastion of security and all that sort of thing. <laughs> Trust me, I have my neurotic moments. I know, just go with me on this. But even today, I mean, I, I would say there's three rules of writing. Two of which are obvious, the third is not. The first two, two are obvious are inspiration, you've got to be inspired. And desperation, you have to do the work. I'm sorry, perspiration. But the third most important is desperation. And that is, I'm not fit to do anything else like hold a real job. And that fear keeps me going. That fear that if I don't do this, 
I'll have to wake up at 6 in the morning and sell pens at a pharmacy. Keeps me on going to the paper. That fear that I, stu I suck every time I write keeps me going. If I think I'm good, only bad writers think they're good. Only bad writers. If you meet a writer like, yeah, this thing I'm writing is really bad. It sucks. Trust me. <laughs> the worst piece of dog in the world. Only bad writers. The rest of us are angsty all the time. It didn't work. I'm sitting there writing my book right now, and I'll be getting, oh my god, this is horrible. I was so good before. <laughs> Five minutes later, I'll be, this is sheer genius. <laughs> Someone's going to read those ad books that are already out there and not give this work of Shakespearean proportions <laughs> a chance. That goes on all the time. You think that goes away? I've had 23 novels, 50 million in print, blah, blah, blah. No, it never goes away. If it goes away, I think that's when I'm done. I think that's when I'm phoning it in. If you don't like to live with that neurosis, don't write. There's plenty of easier ways of making a living. In fact, one of my rules is if you can do anything other than write, do it. <laughs> the reason I say that is if you want to write, you're not going to listen to me. And that's great. That's kind of great. Uh, what else we got here? Read a lot. I don't know any musician who doesn't listen to a lot of music. I don't know any writer who doesn't read a lot. But, there's always a but caveat. But, while I'm writing, or reading, I feel guilty I'm not writing. In fact, all the time, I feel guilty I'm not. This guilt never leaves me. Whatever I'm doing in my life, driving the kids in a carpool, coming in to speak to you nice people, there's always a voice in my head that says, you should be right. You shouldn't be doing that, you should be right. No matter what else I'm doing, no matter how much fun, it ruins all my fun. I recently, because I'm, I'm, I'm very poorly rounded, I have nothing else in my life but writing in my family. That's it, I got no hobbies, I, I don't play glass whatever. I don't know anything. So recently, a couple years ago, I took up golf. Why I didn't smash a glass and jam it in my eye, I don't know. I took up golf instead. But even those moments when I'm enjoying it, when I'm out there and I'm hitting the ball, there's always that voice that says, you shouldn't be out of your and you should be home right. That's usually the guy I almost hit with my every <laughs> tee shot, but go with me on that. That voice, again, never leaves you. It's the honest voice of a true writer. So if you got it, enjoy it, because you don't really have a choice. That has to be there. If you're too comfortable with it, you're not going to be in a lot of trouble. Rewrite. I rewrite a lot. I don't know any writer who doesn't. I have another writer in the room, Alifair Burke, by the way. Is in the back over there, who's a wonderful writer. Galifer, don't you teach a class here too or something? I've been here. She will. Okay. No, I, I've come here. Alifair is an excellent, and, and I know Alifair uh, and I agree with you. We know a lot of writers. I don't know any writer who doesn't rewrite except that one guy that none of us want to hang out with. You know that guy? <laughs> That's it. Everyone else rewrites and rewrites a lot. To me, the first draft is like diamond mine. You're taking this, you know, this big, valuable, but ugly stone out of the ground, and it's the next drafts that's gonna turn into something that's fabulous and great. That's why, again, for those first drafts, turn off that self-editor. Just get pages down. Because once they're down, you can go back and change them, because you're going. I actually, to, I said I was gonna wait till somebody asked me, but I'll kinda of do it now. Most of the time, and I change up what I do, but most of the time when I write, I, have a, I do pen to paper my first draft. Uh, 10 or 15 pages at a time, and then I put them on the computer. And sometimes what I do on the paper, it's not even verbs, it's just lines. Two reasons. One, there's something freeing and childlike to me about hand to paper. But second, my first draft is already my second draft. I already forced myself to have a second draft before I've even started. And I don't write like this. I kind of write like this, where every day I go back and go over what I did the day before. Every 75 pages or so, I go back to the beginning. So chapter one, by the time I finish the book, may have been rewritten 10 times or 15, 20 times. Right? Okay. So I write more like that. Also, it gives you a little running start. You're not sure where to start your book. You know, you're know, you sort of stuck. Well, I'll go back and I'll rewrite. It's not getting a running start. And I'll sort of take off from where that place was. Oh, by the way, I've been doing a quick imitation on the road. I don't do impressions. I'm going to break this up for a quick comedy impression. My 17-year-old daughter, my book comes out. Um, I got a full page out of the New York Times with my face on it. So it's out on our kitchen table, whole family's proud, here's my 17-year-old daughter coming down in the morning seeing her dad in the New York Times, big huge picture of him. Ew. <laughs> 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 um, let's see what else we want to talk about. Um, there are jump that trend, I think I did most of these. I'm going to end this in a second and then I'm going to, I'm going to tell you two more things. One, amateurs 
wait for the muse to arrive, the rest of us just get to work. Okay? I'm not saying it is a job, I'm not saying we're not artists, but if you start talking like an artist, you're in a lot of trouble. A plumber can't say, oh, I, I can't do pipes today. You can't say that either. Okay? <laughs> the more you treat it like it's work, amateurs wait for the muse to arrive, the rest of us just get to work. Okay? Um, I always say man plans, God laughs. I said it in every book, it's just good life advice. And then this is my quick tough love portion of the program. Um, don't tell me you don't have time to write. I don't buy you, okay? It's much like the excuse of, oh this, this isn't weight gain, it's water retention. <laughs> Eventually you have to face the facts. It was the great 20th century philosopher Cher who said, <laughs> she said, excuses won't lift your butt. <laughs> Write that down in your processor. Because one of our, my close friends is Mary Higgins Clark. I don't know how many of you know Mary Higgins Clark's story. Mary was 85 and still writing like every day. I'm trying to be 86 now. Um, Mary, when she was 37 years old, with five kids, her husband died. Okay. The next day, her mother-in-law dies. On the shock of that, Mary's got no money. Has to raise these five kids on her own. Wakes up to wait, work right from 5 a.m. to 7 a.m. Then wakes the kids up, gets them ready at the school, and goes to work. But don't tell me you got time to write. You got time to write. It's an excuse. And if you have that excuse, that's great. If your life is so filled with other things, then you're not going to be a writer. That's okay. We got enough of this right. <laughs> we need more lawyers and doctors.